Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for joining us. With the presidential assets given to the Petroleum Industry Act 2021, the PIA, our focus returns to the state of Nigeria's economy. My guest on the program today believes that even though the PIA is welcome, other trends in economic management are worrisome and could pretend trouble. These include debt levels, inflation, foreign exchange and interest rates, just to mention a few. What do these pretend for the ordinary Nigerian and how can authorities best navigate through all these? Newsnight talks to economist, writer and politician, the chief executive officer of Global Analytics Consulting Limited, Mr. Tope Fashua. Thank you for your time. Welcome to the program, Mr. Fashua. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Of course, you're fully, uh, you're fully aware that uh, the Petroleum Industry Act is now in place. And uh, from what the reactions have been, uh, they've been mixed. Uh, some people have said, well, it's cause for celebration. Others have said we should exercise caution. What is your view? Right, I think um, maybe I'll be somewhere in the middle of those two opinions uh, because I remember sometime in 2007 was when um, the idea actually was being pushed by uh, former President Yaradua with uh, uh, Dr. Riwan Lukman as the Minister for Petroleum. Uh, indeed, the idea had actually commenced under President Obasanjo, uh, maybe circa 2003, and thereabout, you know, the idea that we should have a review of uh, petroleum laws, some of which had been, or most of which had been put in place since 1967. Uh, remember then that they were even trying to bench benchmark uh, countries like Angola, like Gabon, uh, looking at the laws that operated in those countries and how current they were. Uh, because in the 60s, uh, the industry was pretty nascent in Nigeria. Uh, we were just happy that we were getting something from these guys, the international oil companies, who, who, who dug out the, the, the crude oil from the ground. We were just uh, basically uh, feeling lucky to get anything from them. However, in time, uh, you know, the new laws that came also came with the more sophistication of the industry. And we felt that we needed to get more. Now, if you're talking about since 2007 to date, that's uh, 14 years and just getting a law in place. Therefore, I think uh, there's some commendation needs to go to the, um, the president and also to the uh, current administration for even uh, trying to get something out uh, at all. I also will tell you that in 07, 08, when the thing actually uh, was uh, very hot, um, uh, you know, some of the IOCs actually swore that the PIB will never see the light of day. Um, however, I mean, we've got something in place now. The issue can now be, um, is, it, is it perfect? Yeah, you're never going to have a perfect deal. Uh, is it everything we want? You probably never would have any, everything you want. If you put everybody in a room and say, okay, let's decide uh, how to make this bill and all the content that should be in it, probably there will never be a consensus, there will never be a consensus except you drive that consensus and accept you draw the line at some point and say, okay, enough of the discussion, uh, let's get ahead because we have a job to do. And so, um, whereas the bill is not perfect, but I think it's good that we have put something in place. Of course, uh, the bill has uh, implications and, and, uh, and that is what uh, the law rather has implications and that is part of what is being discussed at the moment. One of the implications of, is that uh, many are expecting the complete deregulation of the downstream oil sector. That means there will be no cap on prices, there will be no, it will be free entry, free exit, and it will be market forces driving the prices. Uh, many say that is to our benefit. There are others who, of course, think otherwise. Uh, what is your own position, speaking from an economist point of view? Mm, I think it's to our benefit because um, I always question at what point did, the, um, did we start to believe that we needed to enjoy um, subsidies on petroleum. And why petroleum? Why not something else? So how much is a litre of petroleum today? 162 Naira. How much is a litre of palm oil? Palm oil, a four, li four, four, four litre jerry can, you probably will buy at 2,500 or so or more these days. 
I think they would have increased the prices since the last time I bought somewhere around um, Ayede uh, Ogbese on the way uh, to a war from Akure and Co. Um, it was 2,500 then. So if you're, if you're buying a liter of, of, of palm oil, uh, processed palm oil, locally processed palm oil at about 700 naira, why would you buy uh, petrol at 162 naira? Why are we not subsidizing palm oil, which more people probably use? Not everybody has, owns cars. You know, why, why are we not subsidizing that, you know, for people who need to feed in their houses and so on? So, I mean, what's the choice of, of deciding to, to, to subsidize petroleum? Why the entitlement? And this idea that it's our own, let's use it anyhow. You know, it's wrong, you know. So, um, anything that can lead to a guided and um, honest uh, deregulation of the downstream sector should be welcome, you know, so that we're not just, again, you see, uh, because of that, the crude oil thing became a cause to Nigeria. Uh, beyond the normal thing you hear about uh, resource costs, the uh, Dutch disease and so on, uh, our cause was peculiar. In the case of the Dutch disease in Netherlands, when they discovered crude oil and took their eyes off the ball in other places and so on, until they reverted to uh, all the other things that they could do apart from crude oil. In Nigeria, not only have we taken our eyes off the ball for every other thing that we could do with our economy and properly diversify and be productive in different areas of the economy, uh, some of them we never did, we never knew how to do it, even from independence or pre-independence. Uh, but also we found a scenario where, um, we, you know, when the price of crude oil goes up, we're in trouble. When the price comes down, we're in trouble. When the price goes up, uh, we end up uh, importing uh, refined products, which is the downstream sector. We end up importing from abroad at very exorbitant rates because at that point, the uh, refineries are pricing at the current uh, high price. And when the price of crude oil goes down, then we're not getting enough foreign exchange to even fulfill our import needs. You know, and then we have to devalue the currency you know, we, because we're not accreting reserves, we see a scenario where reserves begin to dwindle, the government begins to panic, and then they say, listen, I think we need to devalue so that our people will import less, you know, and, and you know, and at the end of the day, we see there's no, there's no space to operate because even when you, do, when you continue to devalue and say you don't want your people to import, uh, but there are no, there's not, nobody producing those things, basic things that they need here, at the end of the day, you're devaluing the people. Therefore, devaluation of currency is equal to devaluation of the people. Uh, like Joseph Stalin said, you know, in order to destroy a country, you debauch the currency. And so we've seen the Naira being debauched. Of course, Margaret Thatcher also repeated that in spite of, uh, you know, predilection for right-wing uh, liberal economics. So um, it's a good idea that uh, at some point, he again, I emphasized the point about honesty, because unfortunately, not only people in government are uh, corrupt, but also even people in the private sector, most of them are only trying to take advantage of the country and of the people of this country, which is unfortunate. If you are coming from the perspective of taking advantage of the people, uh, what is likely going to happen, they're going to have serious uprising and so on after deregulation. Maybe if you see a scenario where the, prices of, the price of uh, petroleum is just is doubling on a daily basis and before you know it is at 300, 400, 500, 600 naira, you're going to have a problem on your hands, you know. So a lot of issues go in there, but I think that um, uh, we need to get serious at some point. So you can see that a place like a Petroleum Equalization Fund will be scrapped uh, in the new law. Uh, what that means is that the idea, I don't know where that came from, that the price of petroleum should be the same in Lagos State as it should be in Sokoto State or in Maduguri, in Borno State or in Kwara State is wrong in the first place. In a deregulated uh, environment, the prices between Agege and uh, VI will be different. The guys in VI may be able to pay a couple more naira per liter than the guys living in Agege, you know. And, and you use that sometimes to drive policy, even though um, it's a decision of each, um, you know, company, uh, how much they want to sell, you know. Uh, so anyhow, again, regulation will still be there. So a deregulated market is actually a better regulated market. That's what you want. Because you cannot leave everything free and say, let anybody do anything they can, they want to do. No, you want to understand the basis of your pricing, you know, why have we arrived at the price. Otherwise, the private sector guys will say they're trying to max out profit and they're going to put the government in trouble and put Nigerians in trouble and trying to gouge enough money out of the pockets of Nigerians. Now, let me, let me, let, let me ask uh, at that point that you reach and the whole issue of re uh, regulation and all of that, 
there, there are those who have raised the issue of what is going on with the statistics which are supposed to guide some of these decisions and the reality in the marketplace. Um, we get figures from the, uh, the Bureau of Statistics, the MBS, saying that uh, some of the headline inflation rates are actually dropping. But when everyday Nigerians go to the market, they're not seeing that reflected in the prices. You already alluded to that when you talked about palm oil earlier on in this discussion, where you said you're sure that the prices must have gone up from when last uh, you, you, you bought. Many Nigerians have that experience, but the statistics are not showing that. The statistics are showing that, you know, uh, the figures are in fact possibly going down. So speaking again from the two angles, which one do you think it is? Well, um, I think that the, um, you know, I'm not in the MBS to know exactly how they operate. I think we could do a lot better in statistics in this country. Well, I think the guy that's there, the DG, has been there for a while, the professional, and has brought some changes there, but there's still a lot to be desired. Um, structurally and in terms of the understanding of statistics by those who run government in Nigeria. For example, I was in a committee at some point in time for one parastatal where we're looking at the Oronsai report and uh, when we got to MBS, uh, Bureau for Statistics, uh, they recommended that the 2,100 staff at Daraba that worked for the MBS, uh, they, that most of them should be laid off. What are they doing, you know? And I felt, look, why, why, would, you, why would you lay off 2,100 or uh, staff, you, this is not even enough. Uh, because, okay, if you wanted good statistics, primary statistics in this country, and you wanted committed staff who could get real statistics in this country, this country has about, about 8,900 to 9,000 plus uh, political wards. Each ward is made up of uh, like 10 villages, averagely. averagely. Uh, is anybody getting any of the statistics coming from those areas? Uh, we seem not to care. So if, if you had, had 10,000 words and you had two statisticians in each of those words paid by the government, maybe some amounts like fresh graduates could do the job, even youth coppers could do the job. This is another area you could even generate employment. You know, you're talking about if you had 10,000 people generating in statistics office who knew their job, who were spread all over this country today, it's not every time you use hard dog staff. Many times you use the ad hoc staff, uh, you just recruit them off the road and say, this is what you should do. They don't understand where you're coming from. They don't understand that they don't even have a commitment to give you honest figures. Maybe just to earn the little stipend you are giving them, they fill any number for you and throw it back at you. Is there any way of con 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 confirming the veracity of those figures? You know? So we're not serious yet. I also was somewhere with the uh, gentleman, and he said that, look, in some of the meetings that they do, you know, they, they, they generally relegate the statistician to the background. And uh, when the meeting is over, they say, oh, the statistician is here. Uh, please, let's com uh, constitute another committee and ensure that the statistician, they let him go and work it out with them. It, it, statistics should be primary, okay? Uh, so in this instance now, who do we believe or what do we believe? I think, though, that I would uh, sway to the side of the MBS in this regard. Uh, what the MBS is saying is that uh, COVID-wise, the worst is over. COVID was a very, um, uh, very instrumental to the spike in inflation. The productivity reduced. Farmers were not going to farm as much. Uh, of course, again, apart from COVID was this insecurity, which is still around. And uh, farmers were, were being kidnapped in their, in their farms. People were afraid of going to church so, to, to, to farm. So the kind of planting season that we should have seen is not what we're seeing. Uh, it's not what we saw. And therefore, when it comes to harvest, people are increasing the prices. And uh, of course, people have not been productive in general. So that's one. And the second way, I mean, we have this multidimensional inflation going on in Nigeria. Uh, so the inflation is coming from the supply side in terms of fewer goods being supplied, and of course, still the reliance on imported goods in the main. And uh, since you have devalued the currency uh, for about 50% uh, in the last one year or, or less, you know, that means that you're also importing inflation. Yeah, the, all the imported goods have to be marked up. You know, that's another area. Even on the demand side, uh, the government has been intervening. We cannot forget that out of the equation. Government has been intervening in different sectors, bailing out people. There's been COVID bailouts, there's been this bailout, there's all sorts of money they're pushing out. You may not get to a lot of people, but some people are getting the money in this country. And uh, when you give people money like that in an environment where there's not much increase in productivity or in production, that means that people suddenly find themselves 
with a lot of money and heading to the market, and that means that more money is chasing fewer goods. That means inflation. But what the MBS numbers are saying, in my understanding, is that some of those crises, we uh, passed the peak of those prices, so we now have what they call disinflation. Uh, so we're coming down from about 18.12. Now we're at 17.7, 0.38, you know, because we just saw that about 0.37 drop uh, about a week ago in inflation numbers. So it's still acceptable. They're not telling you that we're now at single-digit inflation. They're telling you that it's slowing down a bit, you know, that things are getting... And then again, you then have to consider the fact that the inflation that they report is over a basket of goods, okay, a basket of different things. Of course, the highest inflation we get in this country usually is on food inflation, food inflation. Again, for the reasons that I mentioned, that reason, the, the, the insecurity issue, the COVID issue, as well as the fact that our, our farming is still very seasonal. When you go to Europe and go where they eat potatoes a lot and so on, you will not see a scenario where potato prices are spiking and then sometimes it comes to season and everybody's rushing to the market at the same time and potato prices crash, you know. They found a way of stabilizing that over time and I think that's where we need to get to. So that's the reason why you're having uh, these kind of high inflation figures in Nigeria. There's the question, of course, uh, you mentioned it uh, when you were speaking earlier, when you talked about uh, sustainability. And that brings me to the question of our debt levels. Uh, economists like yourself have pointed out that the way, the rate at which we are borrowing, what we are borrowing for, and some of the conditions attached to the borrowing are not sustainable. Even as you and I speak today, uh, we are spending the bulk of our revenue uh, on servicing debt already incurred, and yet we are borrowing more. The finance minister was quoted uh, 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 in terms of defending the 2022 budget and the medium-term expenditure framework as saying we're going to borrow almost $5 billion to in addition to revenue to finance the 2022 budget. What do you make of all of this? Because there's also the counter-argument that borrowing is fine, provided whatever it is you borrow for, is going to generate revenue enough to pay back both the interest and the debt itself? Well, the discussion on borrowing and debt is a very big one. The last argument you made is the one that uh, my friends who are liberal economists always make. And at the end of the day, they push the country into trouble. Those are some of the guys who are maybe in banking. They are very much interested. Sometimes, you see, uh, those guys in that sector, they like to push... Uh, some loans in the hands of people who they know that will have liquidity. And uh, whether, well, sometimes when they know the loan is going to give you problems, they give you all the same. Uh, and this is an international issue, you know. Uh, I was watching a movie sometime called The, the International, uh, you know, and uh, a Hollywood movie, Hollywood movie, and in which the guy said, listen, what's the essence of debt? The essence of debt is nothing but to capture a country. You know, you, so it's not about the money you want to make from it, but uh, the, the, they want to capture the policies of a country. I remember in post-2006, after Nigeria had managed to pay off most of the Paris Club uh, uh, loans, I was speaking with someone, you know, in the Apex Bank, who was then in the Apex Bank, and he was telling me that right after they, 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 they paid that loan, the uh, guys from some of these multilateral agencies we'll have to call them and beg them that they want to come to visit Nigeria because there was no reason for them to come. But before that was done, they would saunter into the country, would march up to the central bank, you know, begin to call for all sorts of things. Everybody was using Nigeria to get busy and so on. So it's unfortunate that we're back in this. I remember also raising this issue during the Kemi Adi Oshun days. Then, then there was a bit more clarity. Um, there wasn't the COVID, the global shutdown, the global uh, recession of this sort, you know. And uh, of course, they, you know, the ministers were at daggers drawn, uh, not wanting to be questioned at all. She was of the opinion that uh, Nigeria needed to get more foreign loans because the coupons on the foreign loans, that means the interest rates being paid, were much lower than the, 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 the local loans. Uh, however, we were pointing out to her then that the flip side she wasn't thinking about was the fact that um, there's what they call exchange risk. In, and, and you can see what has happened now. In 2015, um, when this government came in, the Naira was exchanging for 196 Naira officially. Today, 
is about 412 or thereabouts, you know. And unofficially at 216 then, we're talking about 517 today. And therefore, uh, you can imagine how much more work, double, triple the work that Nigeria has to do. You have to sell triple whatever it is you're selling in Naira to be able to convert to dollar and repay these debts. I wrote an article at some point that said, the loans Nigeria does not intend to pay. Because at that time, around 2018 or there about 2017, at uh, which I said that there's no way Nigeria will get out of these loans. It was just not possible. So I know that it's, it's nice to meet all of these people, the multilateral agencies, you know, speak like them and all of that, backslap with them. But you know that you have no chance on earth of paying uh, the loans that you're taking. Uh, because again, like you said again, it's not about the velocity of the loans. Uh, part of the idea behind the velocity and frequency of loans could be the general global slowdown and every country is borrowing now and you give that to them. But before then, what was happening? How productive are we? And compared to all these countries that are borrowing, uh, including every country in the world is actually borrowing to spend its way out of uh, uh, the global recession that has come upon us. In some places, depression. I keep on saying that Nigeria is actually in depression economic depression, not recession, okay? Uh, because the depression is a deep recession. And we have always lived with the symptoms of a deep recession, uh, which is depression uh, in this country for as far back as I can remember. It's always been about high uh, unemployment, high inflation rate, low productivity rate, high crime rates, and all of that is what we've always lived with in this country, you know, and, and it still remains the same, all right? so. Uh, so you don't believe so, you don't that believe extent, that you don't we, believe we, that we've we, been in you don't believe we've been in and out of recession uh, two or three times within no, we, the last decade. No, we, we've I, no I don't I don't play that really. No, no, I don't play that. I don't I don't follow that their rhetoric. I'm telling you, this is real economics, and uh, um, this is true. It's something I could argue at any level at any point that we we were not supposed to be um, uh, kowtowing and generally playing to the gallery with some of these terminologies that we hear uh, from some of these places. You know, we're not, we're not Western economies. We're Nigerian economy is a developing economy. It's not even an emerging economy. Let's get real. Let's get real with what exactly we, uh, we have here. You know, so we, are not, so we, 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 we don't go into recession when others go into recession. We are permanently in recession, in deep recession, in depression. Okay, because if you look at the 1930s American economy and some parts of Europe, um, you know, it, when they had the Great Depression, you see all of that here. Uh, you know, hungry people, the fact that they don't queue up to, for bread is because there's no bread to queue up for. Or maybe they rather queue up in the churches and the mosques to get something to eat. But we have millions, millions, tens of millions of people who are poor officially who cannot feed. We have, uh, you know, 15 million children on the streets carrying bowls up and down looking for what to eat. That's a disaster. So except you actually tell it like it is. And therefore, let whoever is leading the country understand the enormity. And whoever is angling to run the country should understand the enormity of the challenges that we have. It's not a walk in the park. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a snazzy little, you know, very nice little thing like a recession uh, that we think, we, you know, we, 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 we want to benchmark the rest of the world. Oh, they are in recession, we're in recession, they're out of recession, we're out of recession. No, we have to understand exactly what the par par parameters are in this instance. So as far as borrowing is concerned, it's okay to borrow, like they say, yes, okay, but, but you know, what are you borrowing for? The point then becomes... Uh, you know, a country that has not actually bootstrapped itself, okay, to the level of, of uh, you know, being able to stand up for itself is not supposed to be borrowing. You can't borrow for things like building primary schools. You should be generating such money from your internal revenue. You can't borrow, we borrow for also, we borrow for even things like gender balance. Why are we borrowing for gender balance? What's the meaning of that? So all of this, if you are borrowing to provide water for a rural area or even for a city, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you accept for humanitarian purposes of, oh, these people don't have water to drink, you don't want them all to die of infection and what have you. Otherwise, you should be able to do that from your revenue, from your internet generated revenue. So what we're seeing is a fundamental um, um, you know, anomaly in governance that we, 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 we need to understand that, look, you know, a country to be able to stand as a country uh, on your own rights and, and not be a joke, you know, you need to be able to do a lot of things on your own. 
so that means that we need to go back to productivity. We need to go back to taxation. Uh, people don't need to understand at some point the need to chip in in order for them to have a good country. And whatever it is they chip in, must be, they, must, they must be accounted for by those who run the country. Therefore, you don't have this back and forth. People would say, why would I pay when at the end of the day they will use my money to buy SUV? And that's where it is. And then these guys say they want SUVs because that's what's going to make them feel secure. And then you use, in a convoy of a big man, maybe you put cars worth two, three, four, five billion on the road, and you know, say people should finance that. People can finance that. There needs to be a fundamental shift from some of these things. We're not borrowing for the right things. We should, if, I was, if I had my way, I will only borrow for things that can fund themselves. I would probably have a matching fund to say, okay, even locally speaking, I have this matching fund. I need, to borrow, I need people to add money to this so that we can do something that can earn. So now if, so it's, a, it's a case of you can either borrow $10 billion and use it to build primary schools in villages where, unfortunately, maybe the children, you have not convinced their parents to send them to school, and then that becomes a waste. Uh, or to build some monstrosity somewhere that's not any money. Or you can use that same 10 billion or even borrow 100 billion to, to, to do a project that immediately you do it, you're going to see the earnings, the flow of, 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 of cash flow and all of that in such a project. And that will justify. That's the kind of thing that can be justified. And if, if government sits and thinks long and hard enough, they will find such projects to do uh, in this country. All right, rather than there's what link, we have. So there's a link it's good to borrow all, fair enough, but all of what we need to saying, be careful. All of what you're saying has to do also, and you alluded to it in answering the last question when you talked about high levels of unproductivity. Uh, there are also high levels of unemployment. So it's, uh, many would argue that there's no surprise that there is an increased productivity because fewer and fewer people are getting opportunity to contribute to the port. Nigeria has one of the highest tax avoidance evasion levels in the world. Uh, on the African continent, it's probably the worst. Again, we come back to the original argument, which is what exactly is it about our own economy that isn't right? As you pointed out uh, just recently, the central bank has banned uh, BDCs from accessing foreign exchange at the official window. And they were the ones acting as the window between the central bank and those who collect small amounts of foreign currency. They had their reasons for doing this. But where do you stand on the argument that they're only going to compound the problem by the action that they have taken? Well, you, I think you asked two things. First, on the, secondly, on the BDC, first on productivity and employment and why this economy is this way. So now basically that this economy is nothing to, uh, the point is that we haven't actually worked this economy honestly. The point is that there's so much fraud and corruption and deliberate, deliberate mismanagement going on in this country. The point is that somehow we have people in and around government who uh, the moment they see the flows coming in, they see a large amount of money and they believe that look, this is so much money, why don't I take some of it? And then we have a scenario where those in government would rather, first of all, uh, fortify themselves with the appurtenances of, of office, you know, make themselves comfortable, buy this, buy that, I need this, I need that. And by the time they do that, there's little else to run the country. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in this country, but the investment required in, to do that work is, is not being put on ground by government. It's gonna be a huge amount of investment. So the difference between Nigeria and other countries is that we're not working our economy. We're not working our economy. We don't have a right vision for the economy. We are not, uh, we're, not, we're not investing in our economy. Uh, we're not organizing our economy. What, 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 what is the, how do other people get employed? I've done the analysis so many times before. If you go to Europe, in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, 17% of those who work at all work for government in the UK. In the US, it's about 13% of all workers work for the government. The highest employer in the UK, NHS, Nigeria National Health Service, and in the US is uh, the Department of Defense, actually because they have all these bases all over the place. But you know, every country thinks about how to get their people employed. Unfortunately, the Nigerian government have left it too long, and then we bought into this uh, liberal ideology. Uh, we are now overplaying it. Rather than being pragmatic, we say people should go and get into entrepreneurship. 
you two don't have any experience anywhere. They've never worked anywhere. They don't know how to set up a company, how to do risk management, how to do anything. You tell them to go and set up a company. And of course, the strategy of entrepreneurship has failed uh, if we're deceiving ourselves. Uh, employment is now at an all-time high, 42.5% unemployment among the youth. That's about half any youth that can work is not working right now. 33% general unemployment in this country. You know, underemployment adds about 22.5%, meaning that as we're speaking now, you employed, underemployed, and uh, you know, it's about 64, 65%. So, you know, now where That's could they have been working? We're You're talking about two thirds of the potential yes, we're not, we're workforce, not, we're not, yes. essentially. Exactly. So, that, we're not organizing our economy. What other countries do is organize their economy? I was in Egypt about three weeks ago for about two weeks. And um, these guys, you know, in Egypt, 100 million people, 1 million policemen are on the streets. Everywhere you go, you see that there's security. It's palpable, you know. So wh why would there be 13% of people working for government in the, U in the U.S. and in Nigeria you can't find 4 or 5%? You know, and then in fact, if you look at that scenario, you see that uh, the, where you find the fewest people working for government in proportion are uh, usually in failed states. So when you go, the highest numbers you see the, in the Scandinavian countries, in Norway, uh, Denmark, and so you see that they have like 30%, that is 2% of people working for government. And what that does is that it makes the country so safe, so secure, so organized, that when you are going as a tourist, you just go into a perfect country, and you begin to marvel, and then you begin to spend your money. Because you just marvel at, wow, look at what these guys have done. So what are the issues? Take care of your environment. How many people do we have working in the environment here, in the environmental sector? How many people are tending the grass, the trees? How many, I mean, where was that they wanted to plant about how many hundred million trees recently? If we had people planting trees here that would germinate in 5, 10, 15 years, we would see the effect. It was, I think it was in Ghana. They were planting about 50-something million trees recently. We have the jobs are here, environmental sector, security sector. If, if Egypt has 1 million policemen for 100 million people, and Nigeria has 400,000 policemen here, with half of them carrying bags for big men, of course you have your results. So, you know, whether policemen or security, uh, the NSCDC or whatever, we need more boots on ground, even in SSS, gathering information. All this terrorism and code that we have, including banditry and code, are failures of intelligence. So in the security sector, in the environmental sector, in teaching, you have 15 million children on the streets, all right? So what that means is that you need to build more schools for them, or you need to shove them into all the schools that you have. Even if you, there's no way you can show 15 million children into schools in this country without having a huge crisis on your hand. That means you need to build more schools. That's jobs for builders, construction companies, engineering companies, no matter how basic you want to make that to, to look. And then that's jobs for the teachers. If, you know, if a teacher is only 500 people, you probably would uh, employ 30,000 teachers or more. There's jobs in this country. The jobs are in this country because all of us are chasing snazzy little things we don't want to do the neat, the, the, the greasy work and all of that. Nobody wants their hands. Everybody's running an investment company. And of late, you see a lot of them going bust. Everybody's trading FX. And of course, you mentioned BDCs. The same thing with the BDCs. What are the country doing with 5,000, 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 BDCs? Which is also itself a record number in the world. Because the last time I checked, the United Kingdom, they have about 145 uh, money changers, brands. 145 brands only. They, they don't even need a branch. Everything is online, except you go to Oxford Circus, you see their offices there. 145 in the whole UK. And when I checked in the US, uh, the city of New York, which is a, which is a, a, you know, a tourist uh, uh, haven, has about 40. When I checked in the UAE, they have 130. Nigeria has 10,000 BDCs. Everybody has a BDC in their pocket. In their, in, their, in, their, in their portfolio, in their briefcase, and all of that. You know, and many people have four, five, six. So the, the BDCs have no argument. In fact, there's something I've heard oft repeated, which is very wrong. The BDCs are actually meant to only cover for Form A transactions, invisible trade transactions, uh, school fees payment, healthcare payments abroad, uh, travel allowances. Okay, that's their remit that importers are going to get money from the BDCs itself is an anomaly and a reason to close, it, any, that, close down any BDC that's selling that money to importers. And guys have been making you know, multiples of 50, 50, 60, 70 Naira on monies that they get so cheaply from Central Bank at 390 or so, and then they offload it in the market at close to 500. 
and guys just come there and, 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 and it's, all of this is just a fraud. Some of it is systemic, okay? It's beyond corruption, it's all fraud. Uh, so you begin to think about the average Nigerian and say, why are we this way? And why are we thinking this way? Why don't we have any confidence in our country? Why, do we, why, do we, why are we thinking in such a short-term manner? Have we been so traumatized that we don't believe we can make it on our own in a honest manner? What's all this thing about? And then everybody comes back to complain about how bad the country is. So um, the BDCs have actually, they, they know what they should be doing. In fact, the Nigeria government is not supposed to be giving BDCs money. They're supposed to, see, BDCs thrive in a tourist environment. Unfortunately, Nigeria is not a tourist environment. So you then ask, you then ask yourself, why is everybody looking for BDC license? The number of tourists that come into this country genuinely in a given year, probably you can count them on your fingers. Nigeria is a no-no. It's not a tourist country. Uh, where is everybody going to go to? Go to Yankari Games Reserve is dead. You know, every, all the parks we have in the Obudu is dead. You know, all of those parks are, you know, people are even starving the animals that are in there, you know, taking the goat's meat meant for them home to go and feed their children. And it's can deliberate. Ask, you go to can, Uganda, let, you go to Kenya, time, and you see a different scenario in this regard. Because of our time, let me, let me interrupt you and ask about something else, which is probably equally big, uh, uh, and that is the issue of power supply. Um, research has shown that no country has moved from one stage of development to the other without addressing the power supply problem, if you like, or challenge. Uh, there are people who have given the example of Indonesia, the Philippines. I mean, in the case of the Philippines, one president, uh, I believe it was General Ramos, decided that for the five-year term that he had as president, he was only going to tackle power supply. And by the end of those five years, he completely settled the idea of power supply being a challenge in the Philippines. That in the case of Nigeria, we said, it would be better if we privatized it. We did so, and people are still very much up in arms about the issue of power supply. Well, um, I think the, the fault is in, it goes around to all of us. Uh, the people in government who have come over time and spent so much trillions of naira in that regards, even from the ambassador days till, till now, even in the military days, we've been, you know, basically. Uh, dancing around the issue and making a lot of money and exploiting the people uh, on the pretext that we're solving the power problem. However, even equally on the part of the citizens, our understanding of power generation uh, is warped in a way. Uh, many of us believe that until we go to Siemens in Germany or we go to uh, General Electric in the USA, we can fix our problem. On the, the, the only solution for in that sector is until we understand that power generation is no longer a big deal, there are very young people who are doing great things and generate, they can generate any amount of power. You know, working on the innovations of the time is no longer a bulky affair like it used to be. All right? So I've always advocated we probably need to go back to our universities. Where are the experiments? The people, our students studying electrical engineering, electrical electronics, and so, you know, how much of power can they generate for the village nearby as a project? and begin to make your mistakes and refine them. That's how any country has been able to achieve sustainable sustainability in that sector. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a scenario where uh, you bring all these big companies from abroad, you, they set up their plants, you, know, they, you run it, just like buying a generating set. If you buy a generating set, if you are very frugal, after a few years, you begin to have problems with them. And in this instance, by the time you go back to the original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, they tell you, sorry, we don't service that. Uh, technology anymore and that's our bane in this country we bring in technology just to solve the problem of the moment and then we develop no capacity to be able to run that uh, for technology uh, going forward and we don't understand that the world is moving ahead on this other side we have great nigerians young nigerians in different parts of the world working for some of these companies if they were going to tell you the truth you realize that technology is always moving and uh, nobody is staying in one place and until we develop the good the, ability to say, listen, we should do this thing on our own. We can do it on our own. We will do it on our own. We will not live where we are. So um, again, I think that the power thing also sometimes get very, very much romanticized, especially the link to development. Uh, from the mindset that I've seen with some of our people, if, you, if they had more Nepal, it may be more Nollywood to watch or more you know, enjoyment to have. 
you know, how do you, how, you know, I've not seen the scientific research that ties the, you know, generation of more power to, you know, to any degree of development to say, okay, if you, if you get the power right, the economy will grow. I think that's the research that we need to say the economy will go by 13 percent as a result of fixing the power sector. Uh, but what I'm saying is that right now, uh, if it, there are so many ways of generating power, there's hydro, there's mini hydro, there's, mini, there's micro grids, grid systems that are small that you can use to power a certain area. Even the whole idea of inserting that in the, in, the, in the Constitution to say it's only the federal government that can do it, of course you can see that that has been vitiated now, even since the Fashola days in Lagos. You know, a few, a few states now have their IPPs, you know, generating their own power and distributing locally. We need a whole lot more of that. And we need some of them to work for free. The new model we are working on now, the, 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 the model of Genco, Disco and Co., uh, you can see that in fact, uh, no matter how hard they try, many rural areas cannot afford the, the, the power generated by those people because, you know, all of a sudden these are very private companies, privatized companies seeking to maximize their profit. You know, they can't understand why they need to give the power at a huge loss to a villager who is not even generating any money at all. So we need a new solution for that so that the power generated by some of these uh, privatized companies can be taken to places where people can afford them and actually pay for them. But this other side, uh, we should have experimental power that be you know, propelled and driven by our academia uh, to solve the problems of those people who cannot pay. Now, uh, we've talked a lot about where the challenges are, what the difficulties are, and so on. And uh, as an economist, I want to bring you, because you've touched on it in many of the answers that you gave to some of the questions, uh, the issue of uh, macro and microeconomic policy management, uh, which a lot of people have said that if you leave the market to its own devices, but you have the right micro and macroeconomic policies, you might be able to galvanize enough people to respond in such a way that you see visible signs of development and growth. Uh, what is it in that regard? What, what can we do? in uh, the short term, particularly in the short term, to turn what looks like a dire situation around? What are the things, if you were to itemize them? Well, um, I think the world has actually moved beyond uh, micro, macro policies. We are hearing about, you know, different kind of uh, areas of economics now, behavioral economics, you know, economic complexity, complexity economics, you know, that, that actually tell a better picture, um, a more nuanced picture of how economies run and how you can get, uh, how you, can get um, you know, uh, results from some of these policies and actually turn things around. Uh, it may be a bit difficult for me to start to itemize now and say, oh, just do this and do this and do that. Uh, again, find, we need to be able to uh, find some honesty to be able to do some of these things. You know, we hope to have that scenario where there'll be a bit of honesty. Uh, you mentioned uh, something uh, just now, uh, you know, I can't remember that anyway, but the point is that if, if we were going to take this country forward uh, in terms of macro policies, um, how, do we, how do we find, put in the checks and balances? How do we ensure that, um, you know, the, the people who make the laws are themselves the ones that break the laws? And, you know, we, we, need, we need revenue now. So what we, we, right now, the point where we are is that we need to increase revenue in order to be able to do all the things we need to do, to put in infrastructure and what have you. I, like, like I told you, I was in Egypt, and I found out that in Egypt, it takes them one month to build a bridge, okay? And in Nigeria, the same bridge will take about three, four, five years to build, and that gives a problem. And of course, the, the, the contract would have gone to Julius Bega or to some of the other companies that are not even native to Nigeria. And the ones that are native to Nigeria, many times they just say, okay, they, they have no confidence in them. You know, so, so, so how do we get to that point? So it's, 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 a, it's a total thing, and that's where complexity economics comes in. That's where behavioral economics comes in. If the government brings out a policy and say, how will this work? You have to think, think through the minds of people. So economics is not just uh, a, a loan, uh, a profession anymore, but a profession that actually taps into you know, all the other sciences and social sciences in order for you to be able to know what the policies that you put in place will be uh, to achieve 
uh, immediate effect. And of course, again, the issue then becomes, should we be thinking about the short term alone? Because oftentimes the short term knocks off the long run. Well, okay, so I think the way to unpack that problem is to perhaps begin to look at uh, different aspects of the economy. Um, um, I'm looking at it like a balance sheet now, uh, debit and credit, assets and liabilities, what do we do? Um, so, so that's why I said that, okay, fine, we need revenues, we need taxes. How do you increase taxes? And not just, not just taxes. The government is entitled to taxes, rates, uh, rents, fees, fines, and what have you. Okay, and I now said, okay, you still have to talk about behavioralism in terms of, you know, why are people the way they are? Why do they resist some things that in other parts of the world people don't resist that much? You know, so, so that, that's that. You have to deal with that and say, okay. Uh, rather than, you know, we're complaining, yeah, I was trying to remember when you mentioned uh, the... Um, the, the, the debt that uh, we, the servicing of the debt, five point something, uh, you know, about 90% of our revenue is used to service the debt and we want to collect another five point something trillion. But then the truth may be that, look, what, maybe it's because we're still talking of uh, a budget of 13 trillion for 201 million people, or whatever number we are right now, uh, which is one of the lowest per capita budgets in the world, okay? So maybe we should actually be thinking of a bigger budget that befits these numbers, okay, maybe we should be thinking bigger than we are right now. And that's why I went to compare with other countries in Africa, okay. So if, if we were able to generate, I think the real issue is how do we get more productive? And I mentioned that let's get more productive. We can even look in the public, in the provision of public goods. I believe strongly that that's where we need to go next. We need to you know, be able to get more public goods out for our people, to do, make this country more safe, safer for our people, to make it more habitable for our people. The basic stuff, man the health sector, for example. Basic health, you know, primary health care. We thought that COVID could have assisted us in repositioning that sector, but we've not been able to do much in that area for obvious reasons, you know. So if you're able to do that, what then will happen is that, you know, uh, you, know you will now be able to get more diaspora remittances, people coming home more frequently, people being happy, you know, to, to build a house in the village and want to come home and see that and all of that. A total turnaround. Uh, it's difficult to actually uh, simplify it so easily because uh, sometimes when I look at it, I despair myself, especially at the opportunities that we've lost, okay? Even since 2019 when I contested today, there are opportunities that have been lost. And then you wonder, oh my God, how are we going to ever recover some of these things? Uh, you know, because again, leadership is about communication. But when you have a scenario where there are very little communication coming from the most important parts of leadership, uh, the people don't even know what to do. And, you know, even if you were communicating, you realize that you still have problems convincing people to do the right things that they need to do. All right. But I think that, yes, we, of course, we have, if we had less corruption, more accountability, then we can actually go to sleep believing that our natural resources are in good hands. But the thing that we need to unleash now is our human capital. And that can be done by looking at the provision of public goods and also encouraging young people in that, in that space. We have a lot of them, you know, to do great things and actually promote the country. Look at the Olympic just ended recently. We had a very bad showing, like, as usual. You know, but we have the numbers. We have the numbers, the 200 million people, and we have actually neglected the youth to their own devices, not understanding that, you know, that that is a resource that can generate a lot of positive vibes for the country. Imagine if Nigeria suddenly had good showing, like the Jamaicans, I don't know, maybe there are 10, 20 million Jamaicans, being able to put that many people on, on, on sprints and on track and field. And there is Nigeria, you know, struggling and struggling uh, you know, we joke with everything. And so we're not able to anchor the energy of our youth. So all of this feed, feed, feed themselves. Uh, by not being able to anchor the energy of the youth, the youth go into crime. Some of them are joining secessionist groups. Some of them are into banditry and what have you. All right, then, Mr. Fashua, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You're welcome. That's News Nights. Thanks for watching. Do let us know what you think of this conversation and much more. Our social media handles are on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Goodbye.